just going to get settled in um, and begin because our live stream will be beginning at the same time. So just so you know, there's a camera in the room <laughs> and everything we're doing, we're going to be recording today um, so that we can share it with people live and that we can share it with people afterwards. I hope you've all had a chance to watch a little bit of the video, which tells a little bit of the story of Make It Okay. But today, what we're going to do is uh, really explore that history of Make It Okay that many of you in the room were part of, which is actually very exciting, um, as well as talk about the milestones, the progress, and all the potential that is still here. My name is Marna Canterbury. I'm the Senior Director for Community Health at Health Partners, and um, this very important initiative is part of of what I get to do with our team um, here at work and in our communities. So thanks again for coming. As we think about Make It Okay and its origins and where it is now, we also need to really think about all of our partners and also lots of folks who were really the ones who started this work 10 years ago in 2012. It's really um, but because of the community and because of Regions Hospital Foundation and boards who really recognized that stigma, that stigma was in the way of excellent patient care for people experiencing a mental illness and that people could learn more and be informed about mental illnesses in the way we do physical illnesses. And so what a great honor that we do have folks from the Regions Foundation board today as well as someone we just met today, Carrie, who was there from the beginning. There's a lot of folks and there's a bunch of folks online that really were part of this first group. So if you were involved in Make It Okay between 2012 and 15, would you just raise your hand or stand up or something? Yes, Donna, yes, in the front, there we go. Thank you, everybody. We also today have a very active community steering committee that continues to evolve this work and grow. Again, some are online and some are here, but if you are on our steering committee, will you also raise your hand if you're in the room? Number of people or recently on. Thank you so much. Again, it is a community effort. And the important part about all of this is really thinking about this journey and all the milestones that Make It Okay um, has experienced and hit. I'm not sure, Donna, if we were thinking that it would be 10 years that this work would continue when it first began, but what's happened over this course of time is that it's shifted the momentum in communities all over the country has come to life and we've learned a lot. Haven't we all learned a lot about mental health and illness and even in the past, three years, this unusual time in our history. So these are just some of the pictures of all the milestones, but you'll also see it's all about people and it's all about partners. Um, the dark green shirts here on the bottom, these are our colleagues in, the, in Iowa, the Iowa Healthy Estate Initiative, who has taken this to the entire state. We have Crow Wing County, we have original awards uh, won, Webby Awards, and things with TPT Television. Again, the journey spans a decade, and there's been milestones all along the way. But I really think it's all been and continues to be about partnership. That Make It Okay has a wonderful website and resources and tools. We're able to train people and, and, and meet partners throughout many communities. But this whole slide could be logos and names of organizations because there are hundreds. Just thinking about some of the partners, they span from states like Iowa, which we talked about, but our original partner being NAMI Minnesota, way, way back in the original formation of this has been essential. We're so glad Sue is here with us today and so is Kay King and Sue will be on the panel in just a little bit because we know that with Make It Okay, we need to educate people about mental health and illness, make it commonplace, make it conversations that people can have. And NAMI has been a tireless source of resources and accuracy and advocacy in that area. We also have, we've grown, have had many um, 
business partnerships. One is in St. Cloud, their business partnership is rolling this out as well as individual employer groups. A couple of our newer partnerships are with Penumbra Theater who is going to be doing a um, let's talk session around race and mental health coming up on May 8th. That these are important conversations to have because as we think about partnership, we have equity and should have equity top of mind and front and center. Also, um, again, so many partnerships, but a newer partnership is actually um, with our veteran organizations and active duty military. Um, Pete, our keynote speaker, will actually be speaking at Camp Ripley in just a couple of weeks. Again, the spectrum just continues to grow and spread. I want to briefly mention one of the other unique partners because I think they're a good example of why partnership matters. And that's the picture that's um, on the screen of our Health Partners Teen Leadership Council. This is a group of about 20 high school age students from all over the Twin Cities um, of Minnesota metropolitan area. They offered consultation to make it okay because we were hearing a lot, what about teens? What should we doing with teens and stigma? Again, that consultation and discussion with them really was informative. What the teens said is, yes, there's stigma, something we experience a lot about. And then they also told us that most of the stigmatized experiences they have that felt like they were in the way of getting care were happening more in conversations with adults in their life than they were with the teens in their life. And so those students took on an action project and created messages for adults to say, you know, here's how we need you to talk with us. Here's some ways that we feel minimized when you say, oh, growing up's hard, or it's just being a teen. Again, it's one example, one really important example of listening to different communities or audiences, because stigma, as we all know, shows up differently um, with different populations, communities, faith traditions, cultures, and ages. So a great example of why that partnership matters. So all this partnership has led to a continued growth and spread of Make It Okay. Um, again, this is part of that progress that we've seen. Uh, the Midwest um, is very active, and not just here in the Twin Cities where we're based, but all over Wisconsin, mm -hmm. Iowa, and Minnesota. And that's thanks to partners like uh, many county governments and local public health and some important coalitions like Crowing Energized and Northland Healthy Minds and so many more. The other important piece here is that during the COVID, the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the world shifted to a virtual world, we wondered how would we and would people still want to engage with Make It Okay? And the answer was yes. And what happened was we switched to a digital format and we've stayed there. And I think that's been part of why you see our maps starting to light up even faster all across the country from Maine to uh, the West Coast. So again, that progress is a story of spread and it's also a story of a lot of milestones. You know, there's a lot of numbers on here, but when you think about 250 million digital contacts, right? Whether that's through an ad or a viewing, et cetera, um, that's impressive or 17 million or more um, downloads of the Hilarious World of Depression podcast, where we were able to partner with John Moe and reach that many people, or whether it's the way more than 5,000 ambassadors that we know about, and all the other ambassadors through a different states and regions that are also bringing this word out. There is so much momentum to celebrate and so much momentum to um, count as progress. In all of this, Make It Okay has really stayed grounded in what sounds like a simple message that when we learn and then we talk and share about mental health and about mental illnesses, that that can reduce stigma. And that has been very true. We've seen that in survey results. We've seen them in conversations with partners. And we also know there's still a lot more learning needing to happen. As we think about um, the COVID-19 pandemic again and the changes in our world in the past few years, there's more conversations going on about mental health. I think we're all can kind of palpably feel that. 
and at the same time, having that accurate information um, is really important to inform those conversations so that they don't just um, create another kind of stigma. You've probably heard me vacillate between the ter terms mental illnesses, mental health, mental health conditions. And this is one of those other really important evolutions about Make It Okay. When you look at that horizontal um, diagram, the green, and we recognize that mental illnesses are treatable health conditions, just like physical health conditions with a range of symptoms, which a range of severity, and no one mental illness is like another, just again, like physical illnesses. We also know that we all, whether we live with a mental illness or have not, we all have a state of mental health. And there's a lot of conversation around that too, and a lot of stigma around those conversations. Um, so whether it's the Minnesota Department of Health or others who also use this kind of thinking, we know that our partners have said we need to expand that language. Here's an example of why this clarity matters. This is all on a continuum, and there is more conversation going on about mental health in our communities. And that can, in some cases, really minimize the experience of a person with a mental illness. The, the example being, well, I'm really feeling stressed or I've been experiencing things that fall on that mental health and well-being continuum. Very important. But that's not to be confused with a diagnosed condition such as anxiety disorder for someone who experiences panic, panic attacks. And so remembering that we all have health, but there's different diagnoses has been a really important part of our communications. And in all of this too, Health Partners has the great privilege of having a research institute connected to our work. So we've been able to measure progress over the years. Three community surveys, one in 2017, one in 2019, one in um, 2021, have taught us a lot. Um, first of all, we know, and it has been reinforced that mental health has always been an important community priority. Now it's top on the list in all the communities we serve. Also, um, some measures of stigma, we have seen improvement, especially between 2017 and 19, we saw stigmatized attitudes change in a really positive direction. We know that nine out of 10 believe that this is a really important work to do. Um, and that three out of four are ready to take action. People like here today, and people all over the country. At the same time, when it comes to stigma, one of our other important findings is that that 2021 survey was um, at a time where there were um, still a lot of COVID um, changes in our lives and restrictions in our lives. And we heard mixed results, that in some ways people feel more open talking about mental health and illnesses. And in some ways, um, they really need to want to learn more about it to be informed. So we felt those uh, two things happening with our learnings. I think the really important one to call out is that one in three still would not tell a friend if they lived with a mental illness. And so we can see there's more um, work to do. So again, I'll end with the concept that Make It Okay has great potential, lots of potential. And that is building off the strong community resources and uh, partnerships we already have, as well as these core programs, our website, which will be refreshed in 2023 in the fall, uh, as well as ambassador trainings that continue. This core work continues while we also listen and evolve. And part of that evolution uh, is what our next speaker is going to talk about. So love to introduce my colleague, Pete Van Duzart. He is, I actually treated the Director of Behavioral Health for Health Partners Hospitals in the St. Croix Valley. He is also the Director and Clinical Supervisor for our Programs for Change program, a substance use disorder treatment program. And he is going to address still stigma. Are you kidding me? So glad to have Pete here.
I don't know if I could stand right behind this table, very still like Mara. So <laughs> camera guy, be on your toes. Again, my name is Pete Van Duzarts. I do work for Health Partners. I've been working for Hudson Hospital and Health Partners coming up in 20 years. Um, my background is both in mental health and addiction. I uh, was licensed as a psychologist in Minnesota. I've done outpatient therapy. Um, and but mostly I did a lot of addiction treatment. That's what I do out at Hudson. Um, and uh, when I, I was I have not been a part of Make It Okay since the very beginning, but for several years. And when I was kind of uh, told about this and brought in, asked to be a, a part of it, um, my thinking was, wait a minute, what is the goal here? Uh, and and they said, well, we're going to change culture's attitude about mental illness. And I was like, all right, uh, how are you going to do that? And the answer was, we're going to talk about it. Um, and I'll tell you, taking on a task like that, taking on a challenge to say, we know that stigma and attitudes about mental illness not only uh, get in the way of treatment, but it leads to people dying. Um, it, it, we know that on the inside. We know that in the field. We know that in the treatment community. Uh, but to say, we need to turn that around. Uh, it's it's a monumental endeavor to to decide to do that, and frankly, it's audacious. Um, I was like, all right, let's try that, uh, and and so I got involved. And, and the cool thing is the the combination between NAMI and Health Partners, um, and I don't think this has been mentioned today, but this is what was explained to me. And to start an organization that was uh, not branded with either, this to start an organization that was branded Make It Okay so that anybody could use this, any healthcare system, any church, any, uh, any business, um, and say, we'll step out of the way and we'll just have the message be uh, front and center. And I really applauded that as well. Uh, so as time has gone on, uh, I've become more involved with, um, uh, with the organization and I started to get involved in, you know, what, what are the conversations? Well, uh, you know, they came up with these talk bubbles. I, you got to like branding. It's very simple. It's like we need to talk. So we have talk bubbles. We need to have conversations. Um, but, but really the idea is that silence about mental illness is the problem. People who work with this, people who have dealt with this, people who have this in their family know it's the silence, the not talking about it, the keeping secret about it, uh, that is the real problem. So let's start the conversations. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, people who have been trained and, and been involved in the program, but just some of the highlights for me about what that was like. So make it okay presentations to communities and different groups, things like that. And then ambassador trainings. So training people to become ambassadors. I don't know if Mara put up the numbers, how many people have gone through these ambassador trainings. Um, and when we do those trainings and when we do those presentations, the main points are, Number one, it's really common. So you see the stats about that. And then my favorite thing was to always ask that question because it's a trick question, which is how many people in this room have themselves or someone very close to them ever struggled with mental illness? You, you can be a magician with that question, okay? Because okay. we know the incidence is one in five. We know each person knows five people. And so it's everybody in every audience. Uh, and, and so it affects us all dramatically. Uh, but the, the other thing was, as I would do these presentations, these trainings, inevitably after the training, someone would come out to me in the hall and say, Pete, can I talk to you for a sec? I'm like, yeah, and they're like, well, I don't feel comfortable to share this in there, but, but I have a brother or I have my, my dad, you know, or, or my son. And in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, I know, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, I, I, because that's how prevalent it is, that everybody's sitting there thinking, I'm one of those people who has the secret, and yet it's everybody. And that's the kind of message that we need to get out. We're all affected by this. Um, and so you can, it, it, it was lovely when people would do that and, and be, become personal. Immediately, you get to know them a, a little bit by them sharing that story. Uh, and so that's what these conversations do is invite people to talk about this, invite people to, to say it out loud, invite people uh, to share or be a better listener. Uh, the other message that was really common in a lot of this is 
comparing this health, you know, and, and illness to mental illness. And, you know, the, the big question, what's, what do you call a, a survivor of cancer? And what do you call someone uh, who is schizophrenic? And what's the difference? You know, that kind of challenge, you know, that a survivor of cancer is a hero and someone with mental illness is crazy. Uh, you know, and and that drastic difference, and and calling that out, and you know the scenario of when you get the call at two in the morning because somebody's in the emergency department, and 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 do you rally around and do you you jump in and do you make lasagna? Those kinds of conversations about how important that is, um, and then one other point that I like to make is this whole idea of changing the narrative is not about political correctness okay this is not about be nicer to people who have who struggle with this diagnosis or be nicer to the family this is not about don't be disparaging or don't be insulting that's not what this is stigma prevents people and, and the great thing is, is you know you have an organization with, with nami in minnesota and the health partners they do the research we know how many years people struggle with a mental illness before they will reach out and get treatment. It's the years of, of silence of being depressed that leads to death. And so this isn't about political correctness or, or getting people to be nice. This is about challenging something real that has a big impact. Um, and, and then I, I was asked, I forgot to click stuff, didn't I? <laughs> Then I was asked to talk, uh, to, to, to contribute some ideas about what's the next part of the conversation. And that is to talk about addiction, substance use disorder, um, as a mental illness and as a co-occurring dynamic that, that, that really affects uh, people uh, suffering and people getting treatment. So you, you have the comparative incidence. Um, and so we know how common it is. Um, but then you start to look at the overlap, which is how many people have both. And then of those people who have both, how many are actually receiving treatment? All right, it's devastating numbers. Uh, if you know anything about addiction treatment in this country and, and just how few people who are struggling with uh, an addiction that is impairing their lives and what percentage of those are getting treatment at all, but then you add to it people who have both have a diagnosable mental illness and a diagnosable substance use disorder. Um, and and we, we've got to do better about that. So we started to build this content about addiction. Interesting thing about addiction, a couple of studies here, is that stigma, as bad as it is about mental illness, there's research to show that stigma about addiction is even tougher. Why would that be? Why, why, why is it even tougher for addiction? And the reason is stigma about mental illness is uh, misunderstandings, thinking that, uh, that, that people are, are just have this kind of weird internal problem. Stigma about addiction is they got themselves into this. Okay, the stigma is much more shaming and, and blaming that uh, they just need to be more responsible. They need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps, that kind of a thing. So there's, there's this extra level of, uh, of stigma that gets in the way of compassion and a stigma that gets in the way of addressing this as an illness. Uh, so we built um, a, a Make It Okay presentation and added some, some content about addiction and addiction treatment, that kind of thing in, in, in the past year. And we've been doing some of those presentations as well. Um, this is the, the, the chart that uh, Marna showed, really important. And it, by the way, if you study this, uh, just a simple understanding the lower left quadrant is where you don't want to be, right? You have more severe mental illness and less factors of mental health. And the upper right is, is uh, where you want to be. Um, and then there are factors that can affect all of those quadrants, right? Um, well, when you add addiction on top of that, and here's the thing with addiction, um, substance use disorder, the overlap makes sense if you understand what's really going on when people have a, a problem with substance use disorder, it's not about being physically addicted. It's about what is the nature of substance use disorders. The nature of it is that people use substances to affect core moods and emotions. And then they, they over time, build a compulsion related to core moods and emotions. 
things like self-esteem, motivation, reward, learning, those parts of the brain that do those core, how am I today? How am I doing overall in the world? That's what substance use disorder is about. Well, it makes sense that if you also struggle with a mental illness or have poor mental health factors, that the, 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 the impact of using substances that regularly shift and, and, and numb out and medicate those, those core moods and emotions is going to be a factor. And so we, we see this all the time. The, again, speaking to the choir here, uh, pre preaching to the choir, but um, we see people for uh, addiction and we know what the incidence of mental health is. And it's a chicken and egg kind of a thing. Like, what do you address first? And, and how do you get down to, to the core pieces? Um, and so that complication is something that's really important for people to understand. Uh, through all of that, as Marna has pointed out, we've made a lot of progress. There is uh, more talk and understanding about what mental illness really is and compassion about this is a, a problem. And, and again, mental illness is a health problem that affects an organ in the body, okay? Addiction is a health problem that affects an organ in the body. Um, and it's really important to just play and understand that key fundamental fact. Um, it's not about character. It, it, it's, it's not about morality. Uh, it, it's not about family upbringing, anything like that. And if you identify it that way, then we can start to talk about it. And people are starting to talk more about it that way. But as we look back into what has been effective and where are the challenges, we know that there's still work to be done and, and significant problems in some subgroups. And so there are generational differences, meaning that uh, younger people are more open and willing to look at this differently and talk more openly and seek treatment than people who are of my end of the spectrum. Uh, gender differences, uh, significant difference between adult men and adult women in, in men being less uh, likely to be open about this or see it this way or, or talk about this and, and seek treatment. Um, communities of color, there are some factors that, that play into that still being a significant problem and, and those messages, those stigmas still being there and rural communities. And so uh, the thing I want to say about that is we, we have different domains of stigma. The big stigma is society's overall view about mental illness um, and, and trying to turn that message around. But beyond that, we have these messages uh, for, you know, what does it mean to be a man and is it weak to reach out for help, for example? Uh, those kinds of stigmas or, you know, stigma, self-stigma, which is is that I don't care what anybody else thinks about it. This is what I think about it. And, and, and I'm, I'm not going to uh, ever admit to this or, or reach out for help, et cetera. Um, and so we're trying to, and then of course addiction, uh, we're, we're trying to find ways to, to break through those barriers as well. Um, and so, by the way, that's two of my four grandchildren age three and other. Uh, I have four and a fifth on the way this summer. Who's counting? I'm counting, okay? And I'm winning, all right? Um, no, but I, I'll tell the story. Uh, I was out, out talking to my dad uh, recently. My dad is doing great. He's 90 now. Um, and I, I said, you know, I'm giving some of these talks. My dad's a, a active war vet from uh, the Korean War era. And I'm going up to Camp Ripley to talk to them too. And I said, it reminds me of something and I, a story about you. And I'm wondering if, if you're okay if I share this. He says, yeah, I don't care. They don't know me. I said, okay. So he said, he gave me permission. I was talking to my dad because uh, in, in my family, uh, I grew up in a family where there were six kids, uh, very Catholic. And um, when I was 21 years old, uh, I lost a brother to an accident. Uh, that have you know suddenly uh, unexpectedly, which is devastating uh, to to any family. And like any family, uh, it affected you know affected my parents to lose a child. That kind of a thing is 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 overwhelming and devastating. Uh, but especially my dad, 
uh, my dad was so impacted that uh, he, he sunk into a, a very deep depression. And in fact, he barely spoke for about a year. And, and he really was out of commission for like three years, like unable to function. So it was beyond grief and it put him in this depression. And uh, I was at the time going to school to become a counselor, you know? And so I would talk to my dad and I'm like, dad, can, are you willing to, and he wouldn't reach out for help. And so I, for years, I, I would talk to my dad about this because he, he just wasn't functioning. And I, I finally convinced him to go see a therapist who was also a professor of mine, who I really respected. So that day, he, he, he and my mom stopped by, and then they, they went to this appointment, and they came back. And I remember I, I was just very eager to find out how that went. And I said, Dad, how'd that go? And he said, oh, all right. And, and I said, uh, what, was it helpful to you? And he said, yeah. I was like, great. And I said, what did, what did he recommend? He recommended keep going. All right. I said, are you going to do that? He said, no. And I said, why? And he said, because it's a luxury. And, uh, you know, frankly, I got that. I mean, I'm from that family. I'm from that culture. I know my dad. Uh, but that was just the bottom line is like, the, 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 it was a personal thing and, and it was a private thing. And it was something that had to, for his, in his opinion, was something that he ought to be able to take a, care of by himself, kind of a thing. And my dad continued to be affected uh, by uh, that mental illness for, uh, I would say about 20 years. And, uh, and, and then things really turned around dra dramatically. And I asked him, well, what turned it around? He said, I started going to this men's group, <laughs> connected to the church. And, and I said, okay, what, what turned it around? He goes, I, I, finally, I, I learned that I'm not alone. I could have told you that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and that is, it, what it was is talking to people, right? It was talking about it openly and realizing and sharing that other people uh, had, had struggled with the same thing. That's what we're trying to do. That was the message. Um, and so uh, as I uh, prepare for this talk, I, I'm going up, like I said, up to, uh, uh, up to Camp Ripley and talk to, the, to some active military and, and vets about this stuff. And we know, so we t I, I was able to talk to some people involved in hero care here at health partners about getting services and uh, to vets and so i had this conversation and she said you know actually the the military is is acutely aware of the problem of suicide and coming up, coming up with responses to address suicide and they have you know programs to, to uh, address that problem she said but the real issue is accessing those services that they built and it's really about making it comfortable uh, and and welcoming for people to reach out and talk about to their commanders to people in authority that the real barrier isn't can they get services that are effective it's is there an atmosphere of it's okay to come to this and talk about this and and address this that's the real issue so these are the struggles that we still have to overcome stigma and, and break through still those barriers that are, are there. Um, I wanna say, and I, I'm gonna just uh, brag for a second about Health Partners because as I've worked at Health Partners, we call it the Valley, those Hudson, Amory, Westfield's up into Richmond and Stillwater, that whole area over there. Um, and I have been lucky enough to uh, help out doing program development. Um, I know some people who worked at, at regions in behavioral for years, uh, and they have their own stigma about Wisconsin, by the way, <laughs> uh, which is not all that incorrect, which is, there's just a dearth of services over there. It's just, you know, what do we do? So the Valley and Health Partners has invested a lot in, in, in the past several years to build services. I'm very proud of that. Health Partners really... It, and I know, because I have to do budget stuff, um, this stuff doesn't make revenue. 
um, you know, but but it's important and Health Partners gets that, so they've invested. We have a new program at Health Partners uh, for behavioral health access, where we're planting um, behavioral health consultants in primary care. And it's not just, you know, someone who's available to do therapy. They're, they're unscheduled, so they can walk around and in real time, they're pulled by the elbow into the exam rooms in primary care to consult with healthcare overall for those patients. Um, we out in the Valley have built a crisis team to address a mental health crisis for eight hospitals, emergency departments. We cover those eight hospitals and we found out that we had more capacity. So we opened it up and now we provide crisis assessment for the entire enterprise with our little team out in Hudson. And it, it takes a willingness and investment from leadership and the, the organizational overall to, to do that. On the other hand, being in this field and knowing this day to day about these services, we still have, even in healthcare, some limitations about separating this out. What is healthcare? What is behavioral health? Um, and, and not referring people for the services that we have right there system. We have to overcome stigma in our own organization with healthcare providers. And so those are the kinds of challenges that we still have. Um, so I've come up with a new term, and this is my grand unveiling <laughs> of a new term for behavioral health care. And that is health care. <laughs> Isn't that clever? And, 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 and I hope that people can see it more that way and understand uh, that, that that's, that's what we're dealing with. How do we help people get healthy? I, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'll just, <laughs> my, I got a dad joke for you. I got a 50 cent. My wife says I have time blindness. I just don't see it. <laughs> wow. She might see this and to be really like groaning about that one. Um, and so as we go forward, uh, you know, I'm as enthusiastic as can be. I'm very grateful for everybody here, for all the people who put in all this work. And the challenge is anybody out there listening to this, it, it, the, we're at 10 years, we're just getting started. We need you in the conversation. Come step up and help spread the word. I'll leave it there. Thanks everybody. Okay. Well, Pete, thank you so much. Um, I hope I always learn something from Pete and am and inspired by that conversation, as I hope everyone else is as well. Um, I am just delighted to also get a chance to welcome our panelists, our expert panel. Oh, Pete, one more slide. Do you want to talk about the, the Make It Okay? Just so you know, these Make It Okay substance use disorder uh presentations that are done by pete and his team know that they are available and so they're online and we'll be putting that in the chat uh, the next one is actually on may 9th so we have found a lot of interest in learning more about that so i didn't want that to get get missed now i really want to welcome all of our panelists up who i'll introduce but will sue and fatuma and sarah will you come and sit right up there by pete and then pete is going to share his a clip on mic with all of you as we uh, talk through this. I would like to introduce each of them. You have a program and you can read about all of their accolades, but I'd rather introduce just who they are to us and to make it okay. You've already had the opportunity to meet Pete. Next to Pete, on Pete's right, is Fatuma Farah. Fatuma is one of our behavioral health case managers here at Health Partners with lots of experience. For Make It Okay, Fatuma has been an absolutely impassioned ambassador. She has done virtual presentations, reaching multiple communities over these past two years, and we could not be more grateful. Fatuma brings this quiet insight and authenticity to everything she does as an ambassador, and she will be uh, sharing her expertise and that passion with us. At, at Fatuma's right is Sue Abderholden, uh, the long-term and very accomplished executive director of NAMI Minnesota. Again, as an original partner with Make It Okay, none of this work today would exist without her commitment, 
and her tenacity and her support and her expertise. Um, Sue is a fearless advocate for people with mental illness, and she will be sharing that expertise as part of our discussion. We're very grateful for you, Sue. And on Sue's right is Sarah Cassell. Again, this is like my power panel. I'm super excited. <laughs> she is the director of inpatient uh, men mental health services at Regents Hospital. She's also been a nurse leader for many years in um, both kinds of health care, whether it's med surge health care or as Pete laid out, whether it's mental health care. She also brings a passion for this work. She's part of our Make It OK steering committee and always reminds us of the experience of real people and real patients when they and their families are accessing care at some of the most vulnerable times in their lives. We are so grateful for her and her expertise as we start this panel discussion. So let's welcome all of our panelists. So I'm going to ask, the, um, we pass the mic down to Sarah, who's going to kick us off, but I'm asking you all the same question for you to introduce yourselves, as well as to introduce um, some of your thinking about make it okay and mental health. So the question each of them was asked to think about is how has the narrative around mental health and mental illness in our communities, how has that evolved in the recent decade? And what are the current challenges and what are the current opportunities we face around mental health and well-being? And what role does stigma play in that? Um, each of our panelists actually has a slide background with some of their key points. But Sarah, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel. Can you hear me OK? All right. Um, as we look at mental health and mental illness, it has just been quite um, an honor to listen to Pete and uh, just reflecting on what we see every day. So looking at this from a nursing perspective, I have been a nurse for 23 years. And in my role as a nurse, um, uh, even in administration, you never stop being a nurse. And one thing about nurses is that we're experts in caring for others, but we're usually novices in caring for ourselves. Um, we all know that the last uh, few years, uh, the peak of COVID, we were just on, on, on. We just kept going and going and never had time to take deep breaths and reflect. Uh, a couple of my colleagues that have retired recently post-COVID um, are currently seeking just counseling and therapy to heal emotionally from the trauma that we all went through. And we don't stop, we just keep going and we don't wanna talk about it. And so we know that the psychological trauma of COVID is gonna go on. Um, research has said right in the peak of COVID that we will get by from the physical trauma of COVID. The physical side we will heal. What will stay on for years is a psychological trauma. And we're not talking about it. We're brave. We're not uh, trained to speak of our vulnerabilities. No, we come in and we took an oath. We took an honor to care for our patients. And that's what we do. But is it healthy? Is that what we're supposed to be doing? Um, one of my mentors is Marie Manthe, and she talks a lot about self-care, and she talks about um, the moral failure, where, again, she shares a story a lot. She has written books on primary nursing. Um, she's really popular here in the Twin Cities. If you haven't heard about Marie Manthe, uh, look her up. She she gave me okay, permission to share her story because she shares a story. She um, talks about being in the career of nursing, going in and um, just giving, giving and giving. You can't give from an empty cup. When your, your cup is empty, you have to stop and realize that as professionals, we gotta fill our cups some ways. 
And so um, Marie talks about the conspiracy of silence where you now I just, I, I'm just gonna come in and I'm just gonna do my work. Uh, but we're caring for patients. If we're not taking care of ourselves, how would we take good care or give our patients the best possible care? That's always a challenge. And, and, and so I, I really just want to mention um, some of the things that as nurses, the stigma that we experience and as leaders, as a leader in nursing, I have had conversations with key staff members that say to me, do you want me to talk about what I'm going through? And when I'm ready to renew my license, I'm gonna fill out the board questionnaire that says, have you had any mental illness? Um, have you had any substance use disorder? But really, if we look at things, does mental illness predict future behaviors? I know we always say when we interview, we do behavioral interviewing questions and we say, we want to ask you, tell me about a time when you went through this, because we assume as leaders that past behavior predicts future behaviors, right? But is it really true that because somebody has been through mental illness, they cannot perform? That's the stigma. So, so uh, many of our colleagues don't want to talk about it. They live in this conspiracy of silence because we, we're not creating that atmosphere, the environment for everyone to say, it is okay to talk about mental illness. And I, and I get this from Sue a lot because Sue always says, people with mental illness do get better. And that's just a line that I love because it's the reality. Um, I wanna be mindful of my time, but um, really just knowing that we have to create a space so Make It Okay has really been impactful in my environment in caring for our patients and our staff, knowing that if somebody is going through some difficult times, as leaders, as nurses, we have to stop and think about ourselves so we can better care for our patients. And I believe that this journey with Make It Okay has made it so much better for us to be able to sit down with our teams and say, yes, let's talk about mental illness. Um, during COVID, we offered a lot of uh, resources and we said, if you're struggling, call this hotline. But I tell you what, I think that less than in the state that less than 10% of those resources were utilized because there was not any encrypted way for our staff, our colleagues, ourselves to call and on the other line would be somebody that you work with and you pouring out your heart about what's going on with you and feeling like, well, is she going to look at me differently when I come to work tomorrow? So we didn't use the resources as we should have. And so we have to think about different ways of when we say here are the resources to our teams, let's give it and give it with them. Um, privacy, dignity, pride, and make it okay for them, for all of us to say, this mental health is, or mental health and mental illness is real, and we're here for the long haul. So, thank you. Sarah, thank you so much for uh, sharing your remarks, and we will be having a good panel discussion. So, there is a card at your seat. If you have questions for any of the panelists, feel free to start writing those. Or if you're online, um, feel free to um, submit those, the questions and answers when we get to that session. Sue, um, we'd love to hear uh, your response to that intro question around the narrative around mental health and illness in our communities, as well as the challenges and opportunities we have now, especially when it comes to stigma and access to mental health care. Well, thank you for <clears throat> inviting me to be part of the panel. Um, what I certainly see over the last 10 years is that there is much greater awareness um, about the importance of good mental health, um, but also greater, greater willingness to talk about mental illnesses. That has definitely changed. And I think partly because of COVID, we've seen a lot of changes, especially among employers. Um, employers are really concerned about their employees' mental health because that obviously impacts their productivity as well. 
but they really wanted to make sure that they're providing programs and access to treatment and things like that so that their employees are doing well. One of the things that I've seen is probably the biggest change is much more actually attention to children's mental health because adults are talking about it and also talking about what are those factors that are impacting them. One of the things we've also seen is there's a lot more what I call famous people, right? Um, actors, you know, uh, singers, athletes coming forward, um, thinking about Demi Lovato, Adele, Ryan Reynolds, Wayne The Rock. I mean, who would think that he would talk about depression? You know, Michael Phelps, Naomi Osaka, um, and actually more recently, you know, Senator Tina Smith from our state and what they're calling the Fetterman effect because Senator Fetterman has been very open about seeking out, you know, treatment for his depression. And one of the things that we know through Make It Okay and, and through NAMI's work too, is that the best way to change public attitudes is for people to share their stories. Because as soon as people share their stories, they're like, oh, I can connect to that, to that person, to that story, to that situation. I will say that um, at the legislature, there is also a lot more discussion about how do we develop our mental health system. Um, many of you have heard me say our mental health system isn't broken, we just never built it. And so what we've been trying to do these many decades since we closed the institutions, which I just wouldn't add, we needed to close, they were horrible places, um, is we just haven't built it. And a lot of that is actually around discrimination in terms of payments. But this year, the Mental Health Legislative Network, which is a coalition of over eight, uh, 40 organizations, actually put together 18 different bills to really impact all the areas, education, uh, higher education, employment, housing, obviously human services, um, but really looking at all the different things that we needed to do to make sure that people um, can access the support and treatment that they need um, in every way possible. I will also say that, you know, 15 years ago, we actually tried to work on a bill to require mental health screening of children. And I gotta tell you, it went nowhere. And there were actually, including a pediatrician who opposed it. Um, that's not the case now. It is absolutely not the case at the legislature. And what we're seeing is actually a high percentage, both sides of the aisle, um, people coming forward and saying, yes, um, we need to create greater awareness. We need to make sure that the system is there so when people do seek out treatment that they can actually access it. Um, one of our kind of um, goals, frankly, uh, being part of the Make It Okay campaign is that we wanted to actually grow a grassroots movement because we wanted to get more people involved so that they would talk to their legislators, that they would help us create change, um, again, so that people could access the services that they need. In terms of some of the channel challenges, I will say the biggest one is the increase in mass shootings. There's just no way around it. Every time it's in the news, my, uh, you know, my heart drops uh, into my stomach and just, because I know that they're gonna wrongly try to blame it on mental illness. Someone with depression doesn't go in and shoot up a school um, or a concert or anything like that. But unfortunately we continue to connect the two. And every time we connect it, it makes it harder for people to come forward to seek treatment, especially for things like schizophrenia. We also, because of the pandemic, we have increased needs and frankly, fewer resources. We had a lot of people who have dropped out of the workforce or retired early, and we just, they cannot find the people. I heard uh, just this morning from one of the providers, and she said, I can't hire anyone to do in-home services for children or adults. I can't hire them. They aren't out there. And of course, the payment rates under Medicaid are pretty low, which doesn't help. We're also seeing, thanks to the internet in the last 10 years, also a lot of horrible information out there, including places where you can go, you know, to, you know, think about suicide, strange products. We also saw during the pandemic, for instance, um, that ticks increased among female uh, girls who were on TikTok a lot. And so we know that there's just a lot of bad stuff out of there that we really need to change. Um, but I think because everyone has recognized the impact of the pandemic, we are seeing obviously legislators willing to, um, to move forward and to, and to really try to address these things that we've seen. Um, I think the other opportunity we've seen is that um, people who caught COVID actually have a higher rate of depression. So that really kind of connected the fact that, oh, our head is connected to the rest of our body. Um, and it may come down to inflammation or something like that. But, um, but we have seen that because most of us during the last three years, felt some anxiety, some depression during that time. I think that's made people more empathetic and more understanding of what someone else could go through. And I think that's helped a lot too. So last I'm supposed to talk about stigma. Um, so 
as you know, we have started to kind of move away from using that word a little bit. And part of it is because when we look at, you know, the definition of stigma, it's a set of negative and often unfair beliefs that society has about people with mental illnesses. So it's kind of this outward, you know, attitudes that go on to somebody. And not everyone internalizes um, that stigma. But when we really talk to people with a mental illness about why they're not sharing it, for example, on, on their job, they're really worried about discrimination. I mean, they're really worried that they're not going to be able to get a promotion. They're not going to get a raise. You know, you don't want to put it, you know, on a license renewal because maybe you won't get your license renewed. And so it's, it's that stigma has also turned into discrimination. And so we actually have to start saying that word and talking about that particular impact. Um, we know that few employers know what an accommodation is for a mental illness. Right. They know what to do if you're coming in a wheelchair. They have no idea what an accommodation is for a mental illness. Um, we know that you might not, as a young parent, um, share with your physician that you're struggling with a substance use disorder or mental illness because you're afraid you'll be referred to child protection. So you're referred about, you know, care, you're scared about being um, discriminated against. And um, and I think I think the other thing, honestly, is um, we also know that there's a lot of discrimination in our healthcare system. Um, Medicaid does not treat mental illness the same. Um, the IMD exclusion. Mental health parity is still a dream, it's not a reality. And so we just kind of lump that on um, in addition to stigma. And I think the other thing to think about with stigma is that in some ways we're telling the person that they need to change when it's really the rest of us that need to change so that our attitudes are changing and not forcing that individual to change. So um, I think Make It Okay has made a huge difference um, in our state and of course around the country. And, um, again, as we start changing the language we use, we start changing our attitudes, we start changing our public policies, um, then it'll really be okay. Sue, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and all of your insights about this um, over the course of this entire decade of, of this work together. Um, we're glad to also hear from Patuma. And I'd love to hear you expand a little bit about your observations around, again, um, the narrative around mental health in our communities and what opportunities we have. Yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me here today. Um, I am gonna focus a little bit more on cultural diversity and how it impacts mental health. Um, I see, again, we all talk about stigma and uh, it's a huge barrier for, our, for all of us. Um, before that, I would like to share some statistics that I think it correlates with everything we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, the reason why understanding or mental health is important and uh, why and the motivations behind Make It Okay anti-stigma campaign. So worldwide, we know that one in eight people live with mental illness, um, about one in five people in America live um, with mental illness and are diagnosed with mental illness in a given year. One in 25 Americans live with serious mental illness and one in five children currently have a mental illness or ser serious mental illness. And um, when it comes to cultural mental illness, there's a lot of things that can um, prevent people from seeking mental health services. And we can see, um, for example, Asians are, are less likely to use mental health services than any other race. And women are more likely to seek mental health services than men. And in general, people from racial or minority groups are less likely to receive mental health care. So because of that, we see um, how culture influences all this um, aspect of how people are seeking mental health services. And I wanna focus on the major factors that affect this. There's so many of them, but um, again, we're gonna focus on stigma, which is a huge barrier. It comes in many forms and shapes. And how I see that in my community, it's um, people, again, are silent or quiet about their symptoms. Um, they tend to 
take it in. They don't talk about it within their families or friends. Um, the other aspect is understanding symptoms. And I'm gonna use the depression as an example. Um, there is no universal language for depression and uh, every culture has their own ways of describing this, the depression. So if we're talking about depression, we need to put into consideration about how someone else is going to talk about depression. And uh, oftentimes we see symptoms um, in different cultures experienced in different ways. And then um, there's also that community support, very important. Um, it does provide that supportive environment. And a lot of people who don't even seek mental health services, they tend to um, connect with their communities, like um, their pastors, priests, or imams for extra support. And then um, the other major one that I see people struggling with is resources. We do provide resources to people. There is tons of information out there, but the problem is because there's so much information out there, it's hard to navigate resources. And a lot of people find it hard to find the appropriate resources. So as professionals or people who have experience in this, it's important for us to assess and then um, provide necessary and appropriate resources. Um, I know the members I work with sometimes when we talk on the phone, um, I can provide certain resources like, hey, this is um, good for you, find out and seek help from this organization. But again, that person might not know if this is appropriate for them. So it's good to um, provide what it's needed based on their needs. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for sharing the thought of life. So Pete had an opportunity to give some of his reflections as part of his talk. And so we wanted to start um, to have a dialogue with our panelists while we have them here. So just a reminder, um, if you could write your question, if you're in the room on a card for now, we've got some coming in online and also some that came in a little earlier. So um, I'm going to just, you're all very uh, expert at this, but I'm going to take some of these questions and direct it to one of you. And then if you wouldn't mind, whoever would like to comment on that question. So if you're online live streaming, um, you can submit questions in the question and answer, and they'll make it up here or in the room, the same thing. So here's a question that, that comes up a lot, um, and it's about equity. So we've had a number of questions about this. But what opportunities do you see, each of you, to more equitably engage in our communities around make it okay, around stigma, around educating people about mental health and illness? What opportunities do we have to reach new groups and populations? So, um, Fatuma, I wonder if you would be willing to start with that since you probably have the microphone and then we'll pass it around. Um. One of the greatest opportunities I see out there is um, all of us, whether we are professionals or organizations, is um, listen to community voices. Um, they have answers. And then the other thing is after we listen, we do need to engage people in different cultures or different um, places. We need to meet them where they are so we can both say, we can learn from them and we can share the resources we have. Yeah, I think I'm just going to hold it. <laughs> it takes a little while to get that. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Fatuma. Um, being a Black um, African uh, person myself, in my culture, just uh, talking about, there's not a, a, a way to express mental illness because um, in some of the languages that I speak, there's not even a word that you can associate and say this means I am ill and I need help now. Um, in some of our cultures, we don't talk about things like that, you know. Um, 
my some of my family members would say, you know, you need prayers or, you know, there's something else that's going on with you. And so I feel like there's opportunity to go into the faith communities because if the faith leaders learn and know that it's okay to talk about mental illness, I think that they would be great resources for their congregations, for their um, audiences, for their community members to say, yeah, you know, let's talk. You need someone. Um, tell me what's going on and let me refer you to the appropriate resources. So I think there's still gaps there, and but I also would say that uh, Make It Okay has come a long ways. It's 10 years, and the conversations are happening. We just have to keep going. Next 10 years, I'm hopeful that you'll call me again. Well, I, I may be retired, but we'll see. <laughs> well, I think one thing I want to add is before we just, you know, want to go into different communities and raise awareness about mental health, we need to recognize what has impacted their mental health. And so certainly George Floyd's murder um, and all of the basically black men have been murdered since then. Um, we can talk about people from the Asian community being attacked in the Walmart parking lots during COVID, being blamed for COVID. Um, a lot more being discussed about the boarding schools for indigenous people and the impact that it has. And so I think we also have to talk about that um, as well. And then where can people go? Um, about 90% of all the therapists in Minnesota are white. We do not have a culturally diverse workforce. And so we also need to make sure that we build up the diversity of that workforce um, so that when they do seek treatment, they can see someone who understands them, understands you know, what's happened to them. They don't have to explain the impact of racism and things like that. So I think we have to also do those things in addition to just raising awareness. Pete, would you like to weigh in on that or on a new question? New question. All right. Thank you for covering that so well. Um, Pete, here's a question that came in online. Can you speak uh, to the culture-wide practice of using the word crazy, as in that's crazy? Is it important to challenge that? If so, why? And if so, how? Yeah. Words that... Um are really broad and have a lot of different meanings, a lot of different contexts um, are, are difficult. So for example, the word depression, um, we know that's a diagnostic term. We know how to diagnose that. We know how to predict uh, outcomes and all that kind of stuff. But of course, it's also just a very common word that people use in their vernacular. So uh, a, a word like crazy, um, is, is so broad and ubiquitous that it's challenging to say that, um, put a prohibition on something like that. I think what's more important is to understand the context, understand what is the message somebody is delivering when they use certain words, um, and is there an uh, underlying uh, negative connotation, uh, stigmatizing, uh, uh, that kind of a thing. Um, and we all know that. You can tell when somebody is being disrespectful. Um, you can tell when somebody is being disparaging, and th that's what we need to challenge. I, I would be careful about trying to uh, identify particular words and put bans on them, or, or only address them as words instead of addressing what are the messages, what are the way people treat each other, what are the connotations pe people put on uh, someone who is struggling. Uh, so, for example, uh, with addiction, too, um, uh, you know, uh, substance use is so broad and prevalent in our culture. Um, and sometimes when we talk about how dangerous that is and what are the effects of, of alcohol use and abuse, for example, it can sound like uh, you're being anti-alcohol or you're being uh, prohibitionist or, or something like that. It, it's important to get a, a little deeper uh, to what we're really addressing, which is uh, substance abuse, substance use disorders, those kinds of things rather than trying to label something as broad as, as alcohol. That's my reflection on that. I might disagree. <laughs> you thought I you knew I would. <laughs> um, 
You know, there's lots of terms that we've used um, over time in our society that we've gotten rid of, um, even though people didn't mean any harm. Um, we don't use the R word anymore to describe someone with an intellectual disability. And I think it's pretty hard for someone who is struggling with their mental health. I think particularly, you know, in, in my work, talking to young adults, for example, with schizophrenia, they just hear that word out there all the time. And one of the reasons they're afraid to come forward is because people are going to label them as crazy. So I think it's okay that we stop using the word and really be conscious about it um, because we know the impact that it has, whether we want it to have the impact or not, it does have an impact um, on people who are struggling with their mental health. Thank you. Uh, I was on one of our mental health uh, units yesterday and this happened where the patient came to the nurse and they were talking and um, the patient was just making fun and lightly said something about the word crazy. And the nurse just said, you know, we don't use this word around here because it has a negative connotation on people with um, living with mental illness. And so I'd rather you say, do I look like I'm struggling with mental illness? And, and the patient said, you know what? I never thought about it that way. This just happened yesterday. He said, you know what? I never thought about it, but I'll be more mindful. And I just sat there thinking, wow. And it came up. So I agree that um, it may not change things, but there are certain words that we as a society can say, it is not acceptable because it's stigmatizing to a population and that should not happen. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts and your wisdom on that. We have lots of questions coming in. So I'm going to sort a little bit and direct a couple um, as well. Um, Sue, uh, we have a question about dementia and whether when we're talking about mental illnesses, dementia is considered a mental illness or not. Um, so at NAMI, we don't include it in terms of the, the groups that we serve. And there are other groups that really kind of focus on dementia and Alzheimer's and things like that. Um, I'm not a mental health professional. I can't tell you exactly whether it's in the DSM or not. I can just tell you within our work that we, we view that differently. Thank you. Um, there's a couple of questions here about, and I'm going to direct this to Sarah to expand um, Sarah, you talked about nurses and healthcare providers and the stigma that is there. We also um, have the question talked about physician suicides being at a, a very high rate. Um, the question is, what opportunities do you see for to bring Make It Okay to our clinical care environments um, within health partners and in the general clinical care environment to address some of these issues? Oh, that's a hard one because uh, um, that hits them a little bit. And um, without going too much into it, it is real. Uh, colleagues are being impacted. I have lost a friend and a colleague that um, was a physician. She had moved to a different state and very young and bright and um, had so much potential. And um, she died by suicide. Um, and the reality is that, again, the statistics, people have commented on it. We ourselves or someone we know may be struggling. When we're healthcare providers, we always feel like um, we have to be brave. We have to be courageous. And those terms are not synonymous with being vulnerable and expressing what you're feeling about mental illness. Um, there is a group, peer support group right now at Regents Hospital that um, looks at second victim effect where a provider may say have an error or something happens and they are living with whatever occurred that didn't go well with the patient because they're thinking, I should have done something differently. This should not have happened. Um, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. So we have to get in 
we have to incorporate what we're doing with Make It Okay. We have to get into the uh, nursing peer support networks. We have to get into physician peer support networks. Um, I have colleagues here um, in town that have uh, pharmacy uh, support networks, um, lawyer support networks. So there are so many disciplines and uh, work that's being done. But I believe that um, HPSP as a role, and of course, we want to make sure that our patients are safe. We want to make sure that our care providers are, are prepared and are ready to take care of our patients. But we also have to create a space for our care providers. So yes, there is room. Sorry for my long answer. It's good. It's a complex question. Kate, I know you've been doing some work with our um, care providers around educating around SUD. Did you want to add to any of the comments about reaching our clinician workforce? Um, yeah, you know, getting referrals for substance use disorders, uh, it's, it's difficult when you know the statistics, you know how many people who go through an emergency department are clearly exhibiting symptoms of, uh, of addiction or substance use disorder, withdrawal, something like that, um, or even people going through our primary care clinics who also have that issue, um, and yet still not getting referrals. And um, so I, I think just uh, people understanding that addiction uh, is a healthcare concern. It affects all health. It affects everything else they're being treated for um, and taking opportunity to make that referral. So in emergency doctors, like I do acute care, I'm uh, addressing the immediate need um, and I may not see that it's their role to make that referral and may not feel that the person is open or willing to address that referral. Um, but you make the referral. If you see the symptoms, you put you put it put in the referral, uh, and it becomes part of the story. It becomes part of the chart. Um, and next time they're seeing their doctor, the doctor can ask, you know, hey, I see that this was recommended, that kind of a thing. And so that's what I mean. I, it's not any ill intent. It's not any uh, uninformed. It's more just what providers understanding their role and thinking it might be outside their scope, and yet it's so important to identify the symptom, make the recommendation, to have an assessment. Uh, and have it become a part of that story. That's some of the obstacles that I think still do exist. Thank you so much. Um, there's a, a, a number of questions or comments. Um, and Sue, I'm gonna start with you and then ask other panelists if they'd like to add around gun violence and around, around shooting. Um, we have questions coming in about, could you expand on that more? We have questions around, uh, is there a way to have more informed conversations around mass shootings um, and the perception uh, that, or of the frequency of how often a shooter is, um, is suicidal um, in their actions? So we're getting enough. I wondered if you could expand some on that and then go to the panel. So we're lucky in Minnesota, we have Jillian Peterson um, over at Augsburg, or sorry, Hamlin University has done the most intensive research about gun violence um, and mass shooters, including interviewing the ones that are still alive, all sorts of things. And so what she will say is that it's multiple things that led to it. It wasn't just that someone had depression, right? Um, and it wasn't uh, just that someone had a breakup. There was usually some seminal event that happened before the mass shooting happened. Um, and they're almost always white men. But the number one reason the mass shootings happen is because people have access to guns. I hate to say that, but it's true. Doesn't mean that we should take away all the guns, but it does mean that that is an issue um, and that we need to make sure that when we know someone is struggling, that they don't have access to guns. Um, when you look at some of the national statistics, only about 4% of violent crimes are committed by someone with a serious mental illness. So we really can't tie the two together. Um, I will also say that, um, you know, if you if you look at most of the mass shootings that happened, it wasn't that someone was actually experiencing psychosis or an, an extreme, you know, mental health crisis at that point in time, right? Because, because you're planning this out. So you're not, you know, but something happened that triggered it to, to have them do that. Um, there are several bills, of course, going through the legislature uh, right now to address it. 
Um, in some states, they've looked at um, having a longer um, waiting period um, to make sure that if someone is thinking that this is what they want to do, they can't get the gun immediately. And even in terms of suicide, that time will pass. Um, and so sometimes they've seen waiting times um, have really helped. Uh, of course, the red flag or the risk protection orders, that's the bill that's going through the Capitol right now. Um, we've made sure that they've separated violence and suicide. Um, because in some of the states, the language actually puts it all together and it's different. If you know someone is suicidal and has a gun, that's a different action than if someone is going to go out and hurt someone else. And so we've made we've made clear in some of the language that we've worked on that um, those records are private. No one else needs to know if someone got their gun taken away because they were suicidal. Um, and we also know, of course, that most of the um, gun deaths are actually due to suicide um, as well. So there's a there's a lot to wrap up in that. And um, all you hunters out there, I'm not coming after you or anything like that. Um, that's you know that's usually what people kind of react to. Um, it's it's not about people who are hunting. So it's in this country, it's unfortunately a very complicated, um, hard discussions. Um, very. Thank you so much for expanding on that. In the time that we have, I would like to give each of you the same question um, to close up our panel conversation. So what is your go-to response when someone asks, how do I find a therapist or mental health care? I don't know if I have a response per se, but... I would say that uh, primary care, may, because we can't rule out the fact that um, they have people have relationships with their primary care providers, and primary care providers are often open to making those referrals. I think they could do more, uh, as Pete is telling us, and which is correct. Uh, but we should start with um, just talking about it, talking about it. Um, seeing what is out there and um, looking up resources. I think also resources are available and uh, even our website here, Make It Okay, is a great resource to start. So I don't have a perfect answer to that, but I will say the first step is recognizing what's going on and finding someone to talk to. Thank you, Sarah. Um, because money is often an issue, I would say, go to your health plan and look at to see who's in network. Um, because when you go out of network, you pay more. Now, I will say I just happened to help someone today look at their network looking for a psychiatrist. They lived in Minneapolis. Their health plan had zero psychiatrists in Minneapolis. Surrounding areas, there were two in St. Paul, a lot in St. Louis Park, um, but none in the city of Minneapolis. Um, then I went to look for clinical social workers for her. Same thing. There were actually, there was one therapist. Um, so one thing you just need to know is that sometimes the networks are more narrow when you're looking for a mental health provider. Um, you may have to go out of network, which means you're going to pay more out of pocket. Um, the other suggestion is to go to Fast Tracker because you can actually put in your insurance and your zip code. You can see if they have immediate openings, and that can also be helpful at times. And then not to forget our community mental health centers or our certified community behavioral health clinics, where you can often get in um, almost right away. Um, and um, the health plans are supposed to, um, under state law, unless they're a self-insured plan, um, actually have access to those as well. Um, I will say this one depends. And uh, again, like Sarah said, primary care. But a lot of people don't have primary care providers. So what will you do? And some of them will not want to establish care. So most oftentimes working for an insurance company, I will tell them, hey, call that number behind your insurance and someone would be more than happy to help you. Um, if that's not the case, because you, we are working with different kinds of people, um, some people have language barriers, so they're not able to speak with somebody um, or some people does not have access to a smartphone or internet. How do you um, provide help? So most oftentimes I will help them connect to their own communities. And again, most important, if even if they don't have a primary care provider, I suggest just get a doctor, talk to your doctor. That's a good start. Thank you, Batumba. Pete, can you give us a quick last word on your advice? Well, to be consistent with the message, uh, we're talking about healthcare 
And so the, the same way you would access other healthcare, there, there's this notion that I need to find the right therapist and that therapy is you know, somehow so different than healthcare. Um, and it's not, it's important to get the right therapist and it's important to get the right care. You need to trust that we in the field know how to help sort out and match people up, that kind of thing. So you go to your primary care doctor, you call your insurance, you go to your employer's EAP. If you don't have any of those resources, you go to the county human services like you would for any other kind of need for healthcare. Um, and then trust that those of us in the field will help uh, connect you to the, the appropriate level of care. That is all the time we have for our panel today, but I'm so grateful to all of you for your wisdom and all you shared. We give them a round of applause. Thank you all. Well, as we wrap up our time together, I would love to welcome uh, Pahua Hoffman, uh, who's going to give some closing remarks on where we are from here. Well, I, I thought I had the easy task, but I think after listening to all of you, I think it's a really difficult task to, to wrap everything up. Um, before I introduce myself, uh, on your places um, was a card with the QR code. So Marna uh, would probably want you to uh, complete the evaluation survey. So please do that. Um, but I am Pahua Hoffman and I lead our government community relations here at Health Partners. Um, I've only been here for a year and two months, um, but 10 years ago, 2013, I was racing around at Twin Cities Public Television where I was working then because we were getting ready for the premiere of episode one of the Make It Okay on air broadcast. And we were getting ready um, to welcome 150 people into Studio A, which is the larger of our two studios. And in the other studio, um, Studio B, the smaller one, Kathy Werzer was interviewing um, Sue, actually, among other guests. And I remember um, being a part of that and the energy in that room about we were about to do something really big. So it's really great to be here 10 years later and work here at Health Partners. And looking at Donna, who was a part of that early days, uh, is really full circle for me. And so last night in preparation for today, I watched episode one. And there was um, many takeaways from that episode, but in particular, um, Kathy was interviewing Sue and she talked about how we don't have slang words for other health illnesses. There's not a slang for heart disease, um, but there, is, there are many for mental illness. And I thought, I was thinking about that and I was thinking how it is notable, you know, Tuma mentioned how in the Asian community, um, it's the least um, likely group to seek care. And I thought it was notable that in, in my culture, uh, there is no Hmong word for privacy, <laughs> but there is a word for crazy. Um, and so I was just, just thinking and then reflecting on the comments today. Um, so A, I mentioned that story about the on-air broadcast because those episodes, one through five, still exist. You can watch them streaming on TPT even today. Okay, here's my chicken scratch of all my takeaways. <laughs> and I know that I'm the only thing between you and maybe your next meeting. Uh, but I, I want to call each one of the speakers uh, um, what I took away. So Marna, partnerships matter, and, and no one knows partnership better than you. And I think you have been one of the reasons that this um, initiative continues um, to get visibility and that the partners continue to stay at the table. So thank you. Uh, Pete, thank you for sharing the story of your dad. I think that's the story of many dads that we know. And so it's always important to hear what was a breakthrough for him. And so thank you for sharing that personal story and also talking to us about the compounding effects of mental illness and substance um, use disorder. And you're right, we don't rush over to our friends with a uh, pan of lasagna when they get through a really difficult episode. So thank you. Sarah, um, professional caregivers, um, being professional at caregiving, but being a novice of self-care and, and talking about the psychological trauma that um, many clinicians experienced during the height of COVID. So thank you for sharing that. 
to, uh, we could have a whole like three day seminar on everything that you talked about, but uh, I think thank you for highlighting the 18 bills that you've been just a tireless advocate for. And we hope that at the end of this session, um, we see some marked change. And also thank you for reminding us the, um, the requirement of uh, children's mental health screening that has also changed. Uh, and then I wanted to take a note, um, Sue is part of an ongoing table that meets regularly called the East Metro, East Metro Mental Health Roundtable. And this is a unique table consisting of state government, county government, um, community-based organizations like NAMI, health partners, and health systems. And um, it's a unique table because we're trying to solve for many of the same things, and we know that we can only do that if we do that work together. And so thanks to uh, our CEO, Andrew Walsh, for co-chairing this table with um, Mayor Carter of City of St. Paul. But thank you, Sue, for always coming and being a part of the agenda. And then Fatuma, uh, thank you for presenting all the data on communities of color and ethnic communities and the challenges that still exist uh, around stigma uh, in those communities and how there are so few concise ways to talk about depression and mental health terminology that I think uh, are barriers for us to help our own community. All right, so uh, just some thank yous. Thank you to Marna and the team for making today possible. So. I think we've gotten better at events in the room and events online and making that all work, but still it gives us a pause every time we step into a room going, I hope everything works. So thank you. Um, and thank you. Donna, will you just stand up because, um, you know, Donna and, and Sue and others were really a part of the beginning of this work. And it's a great honor for me to be standing here, working here, because um, it is Donna's role that I'm stepping into. So she, she is my predecessor and long admired her work. And again, a great privilege to, to be in this role. Um, seeing you in the audience. So thank you for joining us, Donna. And then uh, thanks to all of our panel members and to our Make It Okay ambassadors. I know we have many in the room and to all of our uh, Make It Okay partners here in the room and also online. So thank you. You are what makes um, this work possible. And uh, Marna mentioned in her talking points, there's still so much potential and so much more work to be done. When one and three, um, people still are not willing to share with their friends what they are going through. There's still so much work to do. So um, I hope that you will continue this work with us. We need you. Um, with that, thank you for coming. And for those online, thank you for joining us.